This video is brought to you by Squarespace. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Cherry Ng and Peter Ma. Dr. Cherry Ng is a permanent researcher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Orléans, France. During her PhD study, Dr. Ng discovered over 100 rapidly spinning neutron stars with the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. She then worked on the Canadian Chime Telescope using it to detect and study fast radio bursts, a new astrophysical mystery that involves short bursts of radio waves that have come from far outside our Milky Way galaxy. Her hunting effort continues now in the area of Technosignature as the project scientist for the Meerkat and the very large array SETI searchers. She and her team use these two sensitive radio telescope facilities to attempt to answer the question of whether there are other advanced extraterrestrial civilizations in the universe. Peter Maa is a third-year math and physics undergrad at the University of Toronto and a Laidlaw scholar. He is interested in leveraging deep learning to accelerate scientific discovery safely. His work at UC Berkeley SETI Research Center looks into leveraging geometric deep learning to search the nearest one million stars for signs of life beyond Earth with the Breakthrough Listen team. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to help you build a website and run your business. Event Horizon is made by a small team, so we're always looking for services that help with the hardest parts of integral things to running a small business, like designing a website. With layout pre-designed options that quickly create a truly stunning professional website that showcases your content in the best possible way, Squarespace is the perfect platform to help you sell products and services. You can create an online store that can sell physical products or services. And with cross-platform presence, you can be confident in the knowledge that your site looks great on a desktop, phone, or tablet. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash event horizon to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you. Peter Ma and Cherry Ng, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us here. Thanks for having us. Now, the idea of using machine learning and advanced computer technology to look for techno signatures that we might have otherwise missed, what led you guys to sort of review what SETI was doing and how they look for signals and how they might look more deeply and better? I guess I can take on this one. So what initially kind of motivated this work, at least for me, was rather natural. Like it was just me being curious and interested in implying emerging kinds of tech in computer vision and, and stuff like that to the field of SETI. So we realized that quickly that deep learning algorithms are super effective in all kinds of areas of science, not just SETI and astronomy, pretty much everywhere. And so we were basically looking for, or at least I was at least looking for hard problems to solve that hasn't been approached with some kind of deep learning solution. And so initially that was kind of the idea. And so we wanted to see if this kind of technology could be applicable to this field in some meaningful capacity. So that kind of got us started in looking at these classical algorithms when we realized that traditional techniques were, it could have been improved. So one aspect is looking for signals that us engineers and programmers might not anticipate to find in the data. I mean, so how do you even account for something like that, that you can't even anticipate? And so at least with the promise of modern deep learning is the idea of generalization beyond your data set and beyond what programmers can tell it to do. We thought that this will be an interesting solution to this kind of problem, right, in, in SETI in the sense that we might not know exactly what the signal might look like, but we can train an algorithm to anticipate something that us engineers might not anticipate. 
So that was the kind of motivation to relook at and reinvestigate how we traditionally been doing SETI and see if can give another kickstart with uh, deep learning and machine learning. What data set did you use to uh, search through? So we searched through a previously searched data. It was data collected back in 2016 to 2017. It's an L band, so between one to two gigahertz range. And it was about, I think, a thousand observation sets of six observations, which ends up being 800 or so unique targets. So 820 unique stars targets. And yeah, that was previously searched by TurboSETI or our traditional algorithm and uh, returned. We concluded that from that algorithm search was there was no interesting signals of interest to reobserve. Now, what were the most interesting signals? So you picked something up, signals in the noise that were missed. And now these signals, what are interesting about them and why did why why did SETI miss them in the first place? So the question is, what uh, what is so interesting about these signals that we found and why did the previous algorithm miss them, right? So these eight signals that we have identified, they are all narrow band in the frequency emission range. That What that means is that it is very likely some kind of technological signature because otherwise astrophysical sources tend to have a broad band of emission range. So these ones are narrow band, and so we think that they are very likely of a technological origin. Secondly, they are all drifting in frequency and in time, and that tells us that these signals come from a host stars that have relative motion compared to that on Earth. And we detected these signals in the so-called cadence observations. When when we observed these specific stars, we saw the signals, and when we look elsewhere, we didn't see them anymore. So that's, that's, a, that's a way to filter between radio interference from Earth, which are near field, and will then be seen by sort of from many different locations on sky versus signals that come from a star that would be seen only at specific, only when the telescope is pointed to the stars. Now, have any of these signals, have you been able to determine if they are repeating? We tried to reobserve these signals and we didn't find them again, at least you know, approximately five to six years after they were first observed. So we looked at them back in 2022, around in May, and we didn't see them again. And that's really the tricky part of this with SETI is is trying to <laughs> trying to reestablish yeah. that a signal was actually there. But this drift, so that drift would not be characteristic of Earth interference, right? And why is that? The drift tells us that it comes from something that has a relative motion. So it is possible. Well, how, how to maybe I should say no. Like if the signal does, if there is any signal that comes from another star, for example, we would see it drifting because of the relative motion of this star relative to the Earth. Now, having the drift though is not 100% foolproof that tells us that it must come from another star because it is possible still on Earth that the source that is transmitting the signal could be moving or it could be from a satellite that is moving. So in other words, the, there's there's fingerprints here. So yeah. first you have narrowband, which is unnatural. There are very few radio signals in nature that are narrowband. But not only that, but you have the proper drift. In other words, you can see but what other methods, when they took the data set, what other methods did they use? I mean, did they wiggle the telescope and move it off and back on source? Or is are these just one-offs, a series of one-offs? That, or, or did any of them come from the same star as two different detections over the uh, period the data was taken? We did do this on-off, on-off approach where we took the telescope, nodded back and forth to see if the signals disappear when we don't look at it. And they happen to have that property and so that was very suspicious and then another interesting point was i think a couple of them are actually from the same star or same target actually on the top eight that we found only five of them are actually unique so a couple of them were same 
but uh, some of them were observed at different times. So it'll be like you look at them and then a couple days or a day later you see them, you look at the star again, we register another hit. But it was at a completely different part of the frequency band, so we didn't really associate those two signals together. So it is probably indication of interference again, just a very pathological interference, so to speak. But yeah, that was the setup that we had. We did look back and forth, and we did find some like we did find some signals that were convincing, but from the same star, but at a different time. Now, what about observation time? In other words, if you try to reacquire these signals now, how long do you think you would have to look maybe in order to see them? If, if you've seen two in this data set that seem to be from the same star system, maybe that might indicate some sort of periodicity? So like Peter said, these eight signals are from five stars. So there are some repeats, but they are at very different frequency band. So they might as well be entirely different signals. We would ha we wouldn't. I think we we would hesitate to call them repeating sources, just because the characteristic from one detection to the other is so different. The fact that it comes from the same set of stars. So can you? Well, at least it's a target, though. At least it's a place to look. Yeah. And so, do you guys have any plans to look more deeply into these star systems and train a relative? you know, radio telescope there for longer than, say, four hours or whatever the data set is to, you know, say, can you turn a radio telescope there and watch it for several days if you can get the telescope time, which obviously that's a problem. But is that an option here to make sure that maybe it's like the wow signal back in the 1970s? We can't watch it 24-7, so we don't know if it repeats. So is that the same case here? I mean, can you, <laughs> is there any hope for a meaningful follow-up on these candidates. Yes, it's tough because obviously we like to look at it all the time and see if it repeats. And that's the only way we can verify the signals is to really see them again. But there's so much competing interest here. There's a lot of interesting science to be done. So we can't <laughs> just monopolize the telescope and look at these sources. But yes, um, Breakthrough Listen collaboration, we do have time allocation on the Green Bank Telescope. So I think as much as we can, we would like to look at it again. And we, we also mentioned in our research article that we would really encourage other scientists whenever they have the telescope resources to look at these sources. Now, signal strength, were these strong signals or were they just barely there? You know, is this something that that if we turn a radio telescope to it, might it be lost in the noise except occasionally or something along those lines? So the cool thing about this kind of algorithm is that it, just, it can still pick up. It has no cutoff for how loud these signals need to be. And so it can be, so we can characterize them with signal to noise ratio. And so, you know, on the low end, we have a detection of the eight. We have one that's at six signal to noise ratio or six SNR. And then on the upper range, we have something on the order of like almost 100 or something signal to noise ratio. So in 100, SNR is like quite loud of a signal. And so these range quite dramatically. And But for the most part, these signals, at least looking them by eye at these spectrograms, look like very, they stand out quite a lot from the background noise. They are quite, quite bright signals for the most part. Now, with these signals, so what strikes me is, is particularly important here is that Earth, us, we broadcast all across the spectrum, right? Or mostly across the spectrum, anything we can use. So wouldn't that suggest that seeing signals at different frequencies, shouldn't that be expected with an alien civilization? Now, some hypothesis, I mean, so that is the situation where you're, where where necessarily the aliens are not trying to contact us it's it's a it's a difficult it's difficult to answer but if an alien civilization were actually trying to reach us they wouldn't be hopping at different frequencies all the time to try to get our attention they'll probably focus their energy to one single small part of the band to wave at us effectively right and so to be switching between different 
frequencies all the time wouldn't make too much sense, at least to me, but perhaps there's some argument otherwise. Now, what do we know about the candidate stars? I mean, are any of these stars, you know, these nearby, what was it, 810 stars, are any of them sun-like? Are they where you might expect to see an indigenous alien civilization? Out of the five stars, I think they have different spectral types. Um, We don't know too much of these stars. We just know that none of them have been reported, uh, none of them have been reported to have an exoplanet. But that doesn't really preclude the idea of a civilization. They, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, they could, who knows what a circumstance of an alien civilization is. We need to actually see one first. Now, what other data sets might you apply this algorithm to? Are there other sets out there, say, uh, from the Allen Telescope Array or the SETI Institute or something like that? Can you go into that data and use this algorithm to search for missed signals there? So, they, so right now we can use this kind of algorithm for single dish telescopes. So there is chance to use this on data from say parks, but it is still, as I say, a limited to a limited technology and a limited algorithm in adapting to different kinds of setups with different kinds of telescopes. Now the Allen telescope array is like you said, an array and it has multiple dishes and there needs to be a meaningful way of like orchestrating all these dishes together, all these antennas together to make some kind of detection. And so that's the difficult part. So this work as it stands right now is a demonstration that this idea of using deep learning and using some kind of similar framework is able to solve our problem in some meaningful capacity. Now, how that would look like with different setups, with different data and different telescopes needs to be adapted to be more general. Hopefully that clears up that. It does, but that's interesting that there is a difference between a an array and a single dish telescope. Does that confound radio astronomy actually in general, just the two different setups? No. So okay, so here is so the only reason, at least from what I understand, that there is a difference is how we filter for RFI or for our techno signatures that we care about. So to give you some understanding, the single dish telescope with the GBT, what we take is we take our telescope, we point at a star and point away from it, see if the signal disappears. If it doesn't, that's RFI, that's interference. If it's if it doesn't disappear, it's interference. And if it does disappear, then it's potentially one of our signals of interest. Okay. Now with a like a multi-dish setup, like say down telescope array or with our new work with Meerkat or the VLA, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be forming multiple beams or uh, onto the night sky into some part, some patch of the night sky. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if, if a signal registers a hit on multiple of these beams, right? So if it registers a hit on multiple beams when we're looking at different targets, then that's an indication it's probably interference, right? It's interfering with all of your observations, no matter where you're pointing the telescope at. And so the idea here is that one is a temporal filter, right? You're looking at something, then you look away from something and you look back again. Versus a an array-based telescope is a spatial filter in a sense that you're looking all at the same time. Imagine you got like 64 eyes looking at the night sky. And then, you know, this signal seems to be triggering a hit on multiple of your antennas. That's probably an indication that it's RFI. That's a spatial filter, right? It's, it's filtering it using by looking at multiple areas of the night sky at once. And so fundamentally how we do SETI is different than how we did SETI with a single dish telescope, which is why we need to develop a more general algorithm that works for all these different kinds of approaches. Does that, is that clear? Yes. Now, were these signals, these candidate signals, 8 out of 810, were these candidate signals at any interesting frequencies, such as did you see anything at, say, 1420 megahertz, or where it's hypothesized that a communicating alien civilization might place a signal to get the attention of other scientists that would know what that frequency means? At least what I understand is that there's a couple that are in 1430 to 1470 megahertz range. 
Um, so it's not quite in the the golden 1420 hydrogen line or anything like that, but it is somewhere close to it. So that is kind of, I think there were two, I believe, signals that were somewhat close to that sort of interesting range. But yeah, that was pretty much it. The others were in vastly different parts of the band. So one was like in 1100, another one's like in 1600, uh, something like that. So they're kind of all all over the place. Now you said the range was one to two gigahertz, right? So so it's it's all over the place essentially, right. as opposed to hydroxyl line or something like that. Now I have to ask a certain question. Yeah. Here, and either of you might be able to address this. So we had at algorithms for SETI as they were. And you guys have now created a new one that can search better. Is there still room for improvement? Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is a field that this is a project I'm actively working on. And so right now this work was done, you know, almost two years ago, right? So this is at least in terms of what I'm trying to build is to me is no longer actually state of the art to me. It is still great in that we actually finally did a search. So as in actually completely a search, it is still considered state of art in some regard. But, you know, we're working actively on improving uh, this this approach. And so, so some rooms for improvement are to A, scale up the data that it was using. So it only looked at Green Bank Telescope data. But it obviously would not really generalize to some other telescope that you would have, say, parks. So the idea, one idea is to improve it with more data. And another approach is to, like I said, adapt this to a multi-antenna setup to do SETI. And so that does not exist yet. There's no uh, deep learning solution for those kinds of problems. So right now, this is kind of only localized to just GBT, and that's pretty much it as of so far. Um, And so lots of active research going into extending this to uh, more of our facilities that we're working, that we're doing studying on. Now, a question specifically for Dr. Ng. You work in pulsars, which is a very fascinating area of, of astronomy, and at one point was sort of half jokingly blamed on aliens. Tell us about your work with discovering pulsars. I worked on searching for pulsars for my PhD project. Back then I used the Parkes radio telescope in Australia and the idea is to basically point the telescope to every point in the sky and analyze the data to see if there were pulsars that were not previously, that have not previously been seen before. The way we look for pulsars is by detecting any periodicity in the data because pulsars tend to have radio emission in its two pole and every time when the emission axis comes into our line of sight we see a pulse and just like how it works in a lighthouse we'll detect these periodic pulses. That's also what it gives its name. So I used Pox radio telescope and discovered 60 new pulsars that were not previously detected before. Yeah, so you look and you just see boom, 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 periodic, and that's the rotating pulsar. Now, what does a pulsar look like radio-wise? Is it hugely broadband as opposed to these narrowband signals? Yes, that's correct. Now, what might we learn about gravitational waves from studying pulsars? One very interesting application of pulsar science is that there are these millisecond pulsars, which are pulsars that spin extremely rapidly and they are extremely stable in their rotation, which means that we can effectively use them as cosmic cosmic clocks. Having these pulsars in all different locations in the sky, these clocks in different locations in the sky, and the idea is that if a gravitational wave is passing through space-time, these gravitational waves will affect these very regular pulses of these pulsars in a correlated manner. So pulsars that are from certain area of the sky will be delayed, will all be delayed 
and whereas the other one from another part of the sky might all be uh, coming a little faster earlier than we expected. So by cross-checking this correlated deviation in the arrival time of these otherwise regular pulses, we might be able to infer whether there is gravitational waves in the space-time. Now, fast radio bursts. Now, this is another area of radio astronomy that has been of great interest lately, but there, it has been floated that maybe it's a technosignature, or maybe some of them are a technosignature. And they have the virtue of uh, a few of them anyway repeating. Do you think that that's a fruitful area, Dr. Ng, to look and see if we're detecting technosignatures as fast radio bursts? Yeah, I was just talking about this to Ross before you joined, and we haven't we don't know the exact origin of every well okay let's start with what we know we <laughs> uh, we have now detected over a thousand fast radio bursts and a handful of them we think we know what they are that they are coming from magnetars which are very magnetic uh, neutron stars now we we do think there seem to be multiple classes of fast radio bursts and that it could be the case that there are different types of fast radio bursts that they come from different origins is possible like maybe magnetar is not the answer to everything now we don't think they are uh, alien signals though and the most convincing explanation i've heard is that by now we've detected fast radio bursts from many different locations in the sky and of very different distances now, it would be rather strange if all these different FRBs are from alien civilization and how would they have communicated among themselves to all agree to transmit the same kind of signals that we're detecting as fast radio bursts. So this is one explanation that I believe in. And the other is how we did, how these fast radio bursts burst are so short in time, which means that they must have been emitted from compact sources, something like, a, something like a neutron star. That's pretty amazing though, in and of itself, just, just as a natural signal, because the, <laughs> it's almost like this, you can study birds, but there are very many different types of birds. There's a big difference between an ostrich and a sparrow. So it might be that we're just simply looking at something too broadly, maybe, as in the fast radio burst, rather than trying to categorize them. Do you see that as a problem? Yeah, it's, it's possible that they, you know, are very different types of birds, as you described it. I think we have learned a lot in the last years or so, like, for example, how Chime has detected all this, like over a thousand fast radio bursts, and that has really helped us solve this puzzle. Like, as you, as you mentioned, there are some FRBs that repeat and some that don't, but is it really true that they are different or could it be that those that appear to not, appear to not repeat? Maybe they just, maybe we just haven't looked at them long enough to see them repeat. Maybe they all repeat or maybe they don't. We just don't have the answer yet. It's sort of the same problem as alien radio signals. You got to look and you got to look for a long time. Yeah, I think indeed, like one of the future of radio astronomy is like, can we really have a sensitive telescope, but at the same time, look at the whole sky all the time. Traditionally, radio astronomy is a lot about single dishes, big radio telescopes like as Arecibo, for example, it's a really massive dish that is super sensitive, but it only can look at sort of one spot or a few spots of the sky at a time. So how can we build a telescope that is at the same time sensitive, but also with a large field of view that it can give us the whole sky? All sky, SETI, it must be the future. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Now, when we do that, and we get these instruments that can look more broadly than a very, very targeted radio telescope that can look more broadly. When we get that, can you apply the algorithm to that, Peter? So that's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought about that just yet in terms of the future of using some building some kind of algorithm for a 24-7 SETI observation. 
but as it stands right now, this algorithm will probably not scale too greatly with like without changing anything and just plug and play it will probably not do too well in the sense that like i said it requires a lot of pointing like of the telescope to conduct any kind of study work unless we can't just be staring at one patch of the sky and seeing what comes into our dishes and we need to be moving around for this kind of approach or with this kind of algorithm and so like i said developing some kind of spatial filtering technique is the next step that we're trying to work on and that would be much more promising for this idea of a 24-hour all the time SETI work uh, as you described now do you think that now again telescope time is always the the problem for any astronomer radio visual whatever it's always a problem for everybody's telescope time and funding of course so do you think that with our efforts in SETI right now and i welcome an answer from either one of you do you think our efforts in study right now are inadequate to actually detect an alien civilization? Or do you think that we actually got a good chance with what we're doing? I think we definitely haven't looked enough. This is this would be my first answer to it as to why we haven't detected anything. It's, it's just because we haven't looked enough. Like, so far, of the order of a thousand stars have been monitored for... ETI signals, and that is such a small fraction compared to the total number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And not uh, not to say that those thousand stars that we have looked at, we didn't look at them all the time, which is maybe we've looked at each of them for half an hour. So doesn't mean that in even if the in that half an hour they didn't transmit any signal, doesn't mean there is nothing there, right? Yeah, so I think having an all-sky monitor would be, of course, great, but we're not quite there yet. However, what we're working on these days is the, is the so-called commensal observations, which means we're trying to get the telescope, and we're trying to piggyback on other astronomers' projects so that when the telescope is doing whatever observations, we'll try to make a copy of the data and look for ETI signals at the same time. Yeah, I also want to add on that although it seems a little pessimistic that we've only searched through a handful of a thousand targets, I I do want to emphasize that in the in the total span of human history, there has never been a better opportunity as we speak to have be doing SETI work and have a more likely chance of finding some actual techno signatures. So I just want to say that the future is bright, and this is a exciting time in, in history to be doing this kind of science. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is something that's very, that I'm very cognizant of that, because all it takes is one, and then all, and there it is. We've made the most profound discovery in human history, yeah. and we would know that we are not alone, and that would be the a first for our history and would reframe everything. Now, let me ask you this, guys. When you saw those eight signals, what was your reaction? Did you get chills? So I was the first one to, to look at the data. So I was the first one to, to see these signals, and I, I pointed them out to Cherry shortly after. So when I first saw them, it was like, I think I was in the middle of driving back from Vancouver to like Toronto. And so it was like I was like in some motel, and on the on the four day drive back, I was just looking at this, and when I first saw it, I was like, "This looks way too good. <laughs> this is this has to be just fake, right? Or this is not not real." So like I kind of ignored it when I came back to Toronto to finish up that summer project, which was this work, compiling it into something presentable. It kept looking so convincing as to what an ideal candidate I simulated would look like. So I don't, I don't think I can show a picture of this. But if I were to look at a perfect signal that I manually injected into the data versus a signal that I found, which is one of our top eight candidates, they look v- relatively similar, like very convincingly similar. And so. I it like as any scientist when you first look at these first pot like good detections or f- good results, your first hunch is 
total skepticism, right? It's like this is not real at all because that entire summer I just been looking at pure junk for like as in like interference for like a straight month and a half, and to suddenly see something that actually looks convincing was was kind of disbelieving. I was in kind of bit a kind of bit of a disbelief as to what these signals actually were. I definitely thought it was super exciting when Peter showed me these signal eyes. I mean, thanks to his hard work coming up with the algorithm, uh, the whole analysis, and we actually did, did, did we actually did detect what we set out to detect. Although I am cautious that to that I, I I would still say there's a good chance these eight signals that we detected are still interference. We we haven't been able to prove one way or the other. But I'm really impressed by how well the machine learning algorithm was able to detect these signals that fit exactly what we um, told them to look out to, to yeah told them to look for. Now, what's the future? Are you guys just throwing the paper out there and saying here here it is, everybody look, or are you going to do as best and as you can to try to find even more signals, especially in the breakthrough listen data? Right. So, at least for me, this is really just the beginning. This was, like I said, this was work done in 2021, and so since then, a lot of development of new algorithms in the field of machine learning has popped up to for other fields of science to start exploiting for different kinds of problems. And so, the goal is to keep up with the pace of other fields such as machine learning and deep learning. And to apply them into our kinds of problems and see if we can move this field even faster. And so, at least my personal work, I'm trying to adapt this to, to like I said, different setups of different telescopes and to generalize this beyond just GBT or the Green Bank Telescope and the data that we have there and to extend its search capabilities in, in the future with, with the help of deep learning. Doctor, what's next for you? Well, like Peter said, we're working on extending this algorithm to other telescopes. It would really be nice if we can search for ETI signals with every radial telescopes we can get our hands on. At the same time, I think Peter's work, this this research article is really an inspiration for other researchers. And a lot of people nowadays are interested in machine learning algorithms. The Bricolism dataset is um, entirely public. So it is possible that other people who might have different ideas of how to search this data set could also have a go at it. Now, my final question is for both of you, and it's very simple. Do you think we're close? I mean, do you think within the next 20 years, we really stand a good chance of detecting a techno signature and thus proving that we are not alone? Or would you take a more pessimistic view and say, could take a hundred years. Dr. Ng, you first. <laughs> I am a, a conservative type person. I think uh, I think we'll take us more than 20 years, but if we don't start, we'll never get there. This is why we're doing what we're doing. You don't find anything if you don't look. Yeah. Peter, your views on this. So like I said, like I, well, like what I believe in, first of all, is like with all these science goals that you can't really put a timeline on this kind of things. Half of it requires luck and the other half, which you can't control, and the other half is actual science, which you can. And so in terms of the science, in terms of getting us closer to that, we've never been closer. And the idea of whether or not there is actually anything out there is, to me, seems very naive to accept the status quo, which is that we are actually alone. And I think the more we look out and study the universe, the more we realize that our situation is remarkably unremarkable in terms of being an Earth-like planet with possible liquid water or between some stable star. We realize that our situation isn't actually that unique. And so as some people might say that we're very conservative of whether or not there might be life out there, I think that we haven't looked enough. And the coming few decades in terms of radio study and in terms of study in general is very, very exciting in terms of new technology, new hardware and new algorithms such as the one proposed in our paper. And so in general, 
I'm rather I, I wouldn't put a timeline on it per se, let's say 20 years or anything, because I have absolutely no clue how how that might play out because half of it requires luck. Is that I'm very hopeful about the field moving forward into the coming new age. Yeah. Now, one last thing, and I want to point out that you said something very poetic. <laughs> We've never been closer. And if anybody ever says anything, why hasn't SETI found a signal or anything like that? You can always say, we've never been closer. Now, my last question is this. So out of 810 signal, you know, 810 candidates, you find eight signals. That's a lot. So doesn't that seem to bode well for searching other data sets in general and adapting the algorithm in that we might actually have a whole ton of signals, you know, (laughs) as we progress through this, right? So in terms of the data, like you said, there is quite a lot that we found that were rather convincing looking. And so it does prompt us to search other data sets as well, because eight is quite a lot out of, that's like one out of a hundred stars that we look at. Now, the issue is that like we all need to verify these signals, right? So with previous detections like the BLC1, which was shown to be not a techno signature, and it has fooled our, basically fooled our pipeline in some regard, we had to check that, develop a manual way of verifying if the signal is RFI interference or if it's actually a signal of interest. So these eight signals, although they look convincing, we need to develop an automated pipeline to perform these searches or perform these verifications after we do these searches. And so, yeah, we can probably find more signals that can fit these templates and what these look like. They can look very similar and we can find them again, probably. But looking just for these lookalikes is not enough. We need to do some kind of back search in a sense that we search through. After we get a candidate, we search back into our data, see if we can find any other kinds of signals that look similar to that. And so... That is kind of my my take on that. Yes, we should be searching more, but we should also be searching in a smarter way, in a way that you know produces more interesting science in these detections that we make. All right, that's uh, thank you both for joining us today, and I look forward to future work. This is interesting, sharpening the pencil as far as SETI right. searches. Great for having us on. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, why is the possum carrying a box of paper clips? Oh, wait, wait a minute. He's pelting me with them. Let's say he disagrees with your definition of what a clip is. Which reminds me about the clips channel. It seems you've been uploading three hour long clips. Well, everybody's talking about shorts, but I can't say anything in 40 seconds, so I went with clips. Those aren't clips, John. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, they are. I clipped the episodes together. So clips. So wait a minute. What about these shorts? Up until yesterday, I thought they were a clothing item. Should we do those? No, we will not do shorts. Ever. I've banned them. What about if aliens are discovered? Will we do a short then? (sighs) There's that disembodied voice again. Yeah, I do shorts if aliens... No, not even then. No shorts. Just clips. Three hour long clips. Numpties, the pair of you. And stay off my loudspeaker. That's for official business only. At my discretion. (laughs) And opossum business. Wait a minute. That's not the... No, it's... It is... Go away, you. Wait a minute. That w- a three-hour short would just be me yelling, it's a cookbook for three hours. That might, might be kind of fun, actually. Oh, no, it won't. That's enough. Go back to your research. You have videos to make. Well, somebody's a bit cranky. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier.